The following appreciation of Arthur Penn's night moves is best intended for those who are familiar with the film. If you have not yet seen Night Moves, we recommend you do so prior to listening to this episode. Released in 1975, director Arthur Penn's Night Moves is one of the most thoughtful, genre-redefining film noirs in existence. Yet with the possible exception of the truly hardcore film enthusiasts, it's a title that seems to have fallen through the cracks. Its misfortunes emerged right out of the gate. Night Moves was released just a little more than a week before Jaws managed to hypnotize the masses to a new era of blockbuster filmmaking. But Night Moves is not a blockbuster. It isn't designed to be. Blockbusters are required to leave the audience humming in pleasure, where every character conflict is tied up in a tidy bow. Night Moves works against the whole notion of offering any sort of resolution, comforting or otherwise. This is especially striking because Night Moves is a detective film, a genre of storytelling where the pursuit and achievement of resolution is typically the whole point. Like the vast majority of truly great films from this early to mid-70s period of American filmmaking, Night Moves is reflective of the time in which it was made. Vietnam, crippling political assassinations, and a country operating at odds with its own ideals. Arthur glommed onto it not because it was a detective film, but because it articulated that which he could not articulate himself which was a sense of loss and a sense of aimlessness and a sense of whatever you do, it's going to be wrong. And that very much is what happened over the previous 10 years in America, between all the political assassinations, Watergate, the Vietnam War, and everything that had been happening. Powerlessness. And here was a completely powerless detective who was nevertheless leading the people through the story. Well, I think Harry would like me to leave. Well, I don't think that's necessary. I think Harry thinks it is. Harry thinks if you call him Harry one more time, he's going to make you eat that cat. Gene Hackman <laughs> is Harry Mosby. Hello, Harry. In Night Moves. Well, come on, take a swing at me, Harry, the way Sam Spade would. He's a private investigator. My daughter, Delhi. Would you believe Delilah? Well, she's gone. How long gone? Two weeks. Go find her. Making a living. Well, let's say uh, 125 a day in legitimate expenses. From other people's lives. You can get cheaper. Can I get better? You're hired. Making a mess of his own. On this 40th anniversary celebration of Night Moves, we'll be speaking with Nat Segalov. He's the author of Arthur Penn, American Director. Interspersed with Mr. Segalov's insights on the film and on Penn's working methods, we'll be hearing from Arthur Penn himself, thanks to a series of never-before-heard audio clips of conversations that Mr. Segalov conducted with Mr. Penn in preparation for his book. Well, that was the idea, which was a, to not have a plot-heavy story. To go through a certain minimum action but to have the personality revealed. I want to know what it's all about. I told you what it's all about. You, what the hell are you all about? You're asking the wrong question. Gene Hackman in Night Moves. American cinema of the 1970s was a tremendously creative period for redefining firmly established genre tropes. That's why it helps to place Night Moves in context with the other defining detective films of that era, chiefly The Long Goodbye from director Robert Altman and Chinatown from director Roman Polanski. There's much more ennui in Night Moves than there is in either Chinatown or The Long Goodbye. What's interesting uh, and I love all three films, about the first one, The Long Goodbye, is that it's literally a fish out of water. Uh, Marlowe, as as conceived by Altman and Chandler, uh, is always going to be the most moral man in an immoral situation. And whatever time he's set in, he's always going to be a bit out of step with the time. 
as certainly Elliot Gould was in then modern Los Angeles, which was set in 1972-73. The hell? Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares but me. Well, that's you, Marlo. You'll never learn. You're a born loser. Yeah, I even lost my cat. With Chinatown, of course, that's set during uh, an era which was actually the 20s, where they set it later for uh, costume design purposes, um, where J.J. Gitz, Jack Nicholson, is a moral man, but he's doing immoral work. He's, he's a divorce lawyer, and um, he's always finding himself above the people who are supposedly the pillars of society, the rich people, and he can't do anything about it, which is even more frustrating. Forget it, Jay. It's Chinatown. And that frustration bleeds into night moves, where Gene Hackman is really not a very good private detective. Everything that he learns in there kind of happens around him, and he happens to be the guy who sees it. Uh, and it isn't that he's particularly moral, it's that he's kind of amoral, and he's the, the victim of most of the immorality going on around him. And so he, he removes himself emotionally from what's going on, and he's very much a product of his times. Everything that happens in that film it's sort of the world is crumbling around him, and he doesn't know what to make of it. So we're talking about three films in which the protagonist is completely out of step with everything that he's dealing with. But he's the one we're rooting for, nevertheless. In Night Moves, Gene Hackman plays Harry Mosby. He's a retired professional football player, a job where the sole requirement is winning. But he's now a private investigator, a job in which victory remains elusive. Early in the film... Mosby's wife approaches him as he's watching a football game on television. When she asks who's winning, Harry replies, Nobody. One team is just losing more slowly. It's clear that Harry's powers of detection are scattershot at best. He's long been oblivious to his wife's affair until he catches her out with her paramour one evening. The investigation he seems proudest of is the one in which she tracked down his long-missing father— in the original version of his story, he and his father catch up and mend fences during a meaningful week they spend together. Later in the film, though, Harry admits that this original story was a fallacy. He did indeed locate his father, but he never approached or spoke with him. He only observed him from a distance, reading the funny papers on a park bench. This plot thread mirrors one of the major themes in the film— Satisfying conclusions are hard to come by, even when you find what you're looking for. He then gets within a few feet of him, but doesn't even introduce himself. In his mind, he solved the crime, but he doesn't need to follow through. And I think that's kind of a symbol. Uh, we all, as people during the 1970s, knew damn well what was going on in the country and what was wrong, but we couldn't do a thing about it. In Hackman's case, he prevents himself from doing anything. Harry is hired by an alcoholic former actress whose young teenage daughter has turned up missing. Harry eventually finds the daughter, played by Melanie Griffith in her feature film debut, staying in the Florida Keys with her stepfather and a woman named Paula. What follows is a narrative rife with incest, murder, and even a sunken treasure. It all ends in one of the most iconic compositions in 70s movie history. Harry, shot and wounded behind the controls of a boat, steers in endless circles in the ocean. More than a few critics and audience members remarked on the film's convoluted plot following its release. Yeah, it takes about three viewings before it really starts to make sense. Uh, and I've, I may have watched it maybe eight or nine times by now uh, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And it's a very tough film to follow because a lot of what happens in the first third especially Two things are going on, and this is D.D. Allen as well as Arthur Penn. One scene doesn't finish before the next one begins. You've got overlapping dialogue for about a half a second for about four scenes in a row. People pop up, and Gene Hackman already knows them, even though we know that he's only just met them. This is particularly true when we come to the character played by Edward Binns, who's the stunt pilot. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, he's introduced to him, and then he's, he's, he's crashing in his, uh, in his RV. So there's a lot of assumptions being made. A number of times, Hackman has dialogue which is just sort of given to him. Like he asked Ellie's mother, uh, where's the last time I can find her? And she knows. Well, if she knows, why is she hiring a detective to go out after her? So it's little things like that that you sort of accept because it's the genre. But I think Arthur was less concerned with plot 
than he was with the, uh, the, the search by the main character for himself. Arthur Penn was interested in more than the nuts and bolts of a detective film. He wanted to create an existential experience. So he used the plot merely as a vessel for exploring what America had gone through in the previous decade. Mr. Segaloff describes Penn's intentions, and his insights are complemented by the recorded audio of conversations he conducted with both screenwriter Alan Sharp and director Arthur Penn in preparation for his book. Well, Sharp had written a script which he called An End of Wishing, and uh, producer Robert Sherman, not to be confused with Richard M. and Robert B. Sherman, the tuneful Sherman brothers for the Disney people. Uh, Robert Sherman had been a production executive at United Artists and other companies, and he was very close to all the people in town, and he got a hold of the script somehow, and in order to give Sharp some money, decided to try to set it up by sending it to John Calley, then at Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers at that time was in a very interesting position. Uh, they were doing a lot of movies that you wouldn't imagine anybody would ever make, whether it's Paul Mazursky's uh, Bloom and Love or The Terminal Man that Michael Crichton was doing, which did not do well. Uh, the Thief Who Came to Dinner, you know, which was a, a Ryan O'Neill picture. It just all these weird movies, very moody. And they decided, I guess, to make this one for about $4 million. So then once Sherman got hold of the script, he sent it to Arthur Penn. And that confounded Sharp because he couldn't figure out what Arthur Penn might see and what was to him just a run-of-the-mill detective film. But Arthur found something in it that really touched him personally. And I think this is why directors make choices. And it frustrates writers an awful lot. You know, writers will say, why didn't you just direct the damn script I gave you? But the director will find something in the script that he likes, and he asks the writer to rewrite it. And so in having Sharp rewrite the script to his specifications, Penn was able to focus more clearly the things that he wanted. That was very much what appealed to Arthur, and it was also what elevated Alan Sharp's script when he turned it into Bob Sherman, which is that, as, as uh, you'll hear Alan say, it was a pastiche of detective films. But in fact, Arthur glommed onto it, not because it was a detective film, but because it articulated that which he could not articulate himself, which was the sense of loss and the sense of aimlessness and the sense of whatever you do, it's going to be wrong. And that very much is what happened over the previous 10 years in America, between all the political assassinations, Watergate, the Vietnam War, and everything that had been happening. Powerlessness. And here was a completely powerless detective, who was nevertheless leading the people through the story. Screenwriter Alan Sharp. I mean, I've always thought that the best um, mystery detective stories were basically picaresque novels in which the, the, the guy, the hero goes along and meets a bunch, has a reason for meeting a bunch of people and has different little experiences with them, all leading towards... Absolutely, catharsis. absolutely. The, and yeah. so you, you, you sign on for that and you get the benefit of the... Uh, I mean, my problem is I'm not a very good plot, right? I'm not very good at plot. I'm not very good at plot out of huh. stories, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm much better at having people sitting in the room yakking, 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 and then, then they have to rush out and either jump on a horse or get in a car and drive to the next place to yakking, yakking, yakking again. Director Arthur Penn. Now, Night Moves, a mystery writer I know, says that mysteries tend to be written by liberals but read by conservatives. Yeah. The liberals show how the system doesn't work. The conservatives say, yeah, but in the end it does. Yes. But Night Moves deprives both sides of anything easy to agree in it. It says the system doesn't work and it's fucked. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we it up. let's talk about that, about turning the genre on its ear, so to speak. Well, that was the idea, which was a, to not have a plot-heavy story. To go through a certain minimum action, but to have the personality revealed. But of that particular era uh, uh, in, in, in Warner Brothers and in, in American cinema, we're talking the middle 70s, was really a, a time of, of shifting political awareness going much more into ourselves, which of course is what Harry's character has to do. And people have discussed this, your use of, of lenses and mirrors and reflections, um, especially that, that I think the kind yeah, of... God centric yeah, circles. Yeah. But how much symbolism can you put in a film on purpose and how much is accidental when you're talking about it on the press tour? No, a lot of it was on purpose. Those mirrored concentrics were sort of the, the symbol of the story. I tried not to make it too heavy. Now when I look at it, 
I think it's too heavy. I did it too much. But um, it was just to say this. The problem, we met the enemy and it is us. You, know? you can't do that to uh, Martin Luther King, the Kennedys, and George Wallace. And that there's no, no solution in that at all. Would it be fair to call it an existential film? I suppose so. I mean, in, in the sense of Camus saying that the more knowledge we achieve, the less we're able to do with it. Yeah, exactly. I would say so. Certainly, by the time I got to the, the circling boat, I knew that that was... I hadn't had that in mind, really. I got on a boat and I discovered that there were two power sources, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then I worked out all of that choreography with being able to hook one and not be able to hook the other and lose the, the net or whatever it is, the hook. Mm -hmm. the, the, the boat hook that he had used yeah. to snare it, yeah. And he drops it because he's growing weaker. And then that's when mm -hmm. all that worked out, because I don't know anything about boats, but when I found out that there were mm -hmm. twin blades, twin drives, okay. That's what did it. And when I then said, hey, could we do so-and-so, I knew that I was at an existential point. But I hadn't known you didn't know it until you were there. All that well through the film. For 30 years, people have been debating whether Harry dies. Can you give me any insight? I don't think he physically died. I think he, uh, something in him died. I don't think he could go back to his life with his wife. No, he, he would have been a basket case, I think. Mm -hmm. He solved his mystery as well as the mystery, and he has to find something else to live for, and in the context of the film, he has to, I mean, maybe reconciling with his wife, but what sort of a shell is he going to bring back? Exactly, I mean, who would he be? He was a lovely, lucky Final image. All right, Gene, Hackman, okay. action! You're either going to go back to L.A. with me, I'm going to turn you over to the cops. Hey, Billy, hold you guys. Go, Jack! Go, Jack! You're not going to make anything off of me! All right, Gene, go! Swing! Got it! Terrific, Jackie. Was Arthur has a very complicated way of directing. The first thing is he has the actors go through the script without memorizing the lines, but seeing if they can remember what each scene is about in their own words. This helps them understand what the scene is before they have to nail down the precise dialogue. When he's directing, he sometimes makes actors a little bit impatient because he'll do a lot of coverage. That is, he'll shoot the scene from many, many different angles, over the shoulder, wide shot, two shot, close up, reverses, and things like that. And it's an awful lot of footage. But he discovered something, and D.D. Allen explained this too, uh, and that is that you really don't know how you're supposed to cut a scene together until you see it in between the other scenes of the movie. So while you may know how to edit a particular scene when you're shooting it, I'm going to go for a close-up here, I'm going to swing the camera around there, we're going to go to a reverse. When you see it in the context of the film, its whole pace may change because you have to adjust the notes within the entire concerto. And so Arthur would give himself a lot of freedom to put the film together in the editing room when he was shooting it. This meant that as fast as he wanted to go, he still did a lot more coverage and used a lot more angles. And sometimes the actors didn't understand that because a lot of actors would blow it in the first couple of takes. Arthur has to be very careful to cast actors who can reproduce their performance take after take after take. Well, are we going to talk about it? Well, it's your ball run with it. Oh, don't start with the sporting metaphors. I couldn't stand that. This isn't something we can pretend doesn't involve you. What is this we it's... bullshit? I didn't get caught fucking Marty Heller. Why did you go to him before you came to me? Because I didn't want to be lied to. How do you know I would have lied? You've been doing a pretty good job of it so far. Why? 
Didn't you come up to me out, outside the movies when you saw me with Marty? That would have really been terrific, wouldn't it? I stand here with my thumb up my ass while you introduce him to some client or some faggot friend of Charles. Beautiful. But then when I came home, then, you oh. wanted to trap me, make me incriminate myself, then you could go get the evidence like I was one of your crummy divorce cases. It's a wonder you didn't photograph the bed while you were there. My God, you're really prime, Ellen. You know that? I can't you screwing another guy and you attack my lifestyle. Your lifestyle has nothing to do with it. What is it, for God's sake, a private eye? And it's a joke. At least the job Nick offered you had... I don't want Nick's fucking job. Anyone know what's your job? I like doing what I'm doing. Doing what? People ask you to do boring, trivial sort of things and you do them as if that were a good enough to turn that thing off. Lucky you. You can't have a discussion about the virtues of night moves without focusing on Gene Hackman's lead performance, as well as the other performances that populate the film. Most notably, Melanie Griffith in her feature film debut, and James Woods in only his second feature film. In this series of sound bites, Nat Segaloff, screenwriter Alan Sharp, and Arthur Penn recount their thoughts and experiences with the members of the cast. Well, H Harry Mosby is an amazing character, especially for Gene Hackman, who seems very uneasy in this role, or perhaps the role itself is about a man who's unsettled. And it certainly is that. He is the quintessence of, of American sensibility at this point. Well, I must say, I was a bit, I mean, I didn't have a, a kind of, uh, I didn't have a casting thing in my head, but uh, Hackman surprised me, I suppose, as much as anything, because I think of him as being, like, working class, if yeah. there is such a thing. And I'm not saying, I mean, I mean, uh, so that was a bit of a surprise, and therefore his, his, his Mosby was a, was a little bit of a, oh yeah, so that's who sort of Mosby is, uh, when he inhabited it and did it in his kind of, uh, he certainly, um, you know, he, he got well away from, you know, the, the whole sort of James Garner tradition of a private eye, which was desirable. Well, Arthur had a very strange relationship with Gene Hackman, uh, and who, who, by the way, would not respond to my request for interviews, although his wife, who was a, a lovely lady, said he'll answer two or three questions uh, on computer. And I didn't really think that was an effective way to represent Hackman, who is probably the best actor America's produced in the past 50 years. Yeah, uh, but uh, Arthur said, the, Gene Hackman said, don't ever tell him he's a good actor. He, does, he, he must respect the acting profession, but he really hates to discuss the craft, and he, he just can't compliment him. Arthur had worked with him, of course, on Bonnie and Clyde uh, and made him a star, and then he put him in this, and later he would do Target with him. But he's a very down-to-earth person who's a very nonviolent individual, and here he has to play a detective who's dealing with violence. So I'm sure he himself was torn. Plus, of course, he was going through a divorce at the time, which I didn't put in the book, and was very much on edge during the whole time. And, and Ken Mars, who I bump into every now and then in Los Angeles, well, he can, he's just been around and done everything, but he's a wonderful presence. He's a wonderful presence, and he and Gene clashed. Oh, really? Something about uh, Kenny's... You know, Kenny's kind of a comedian, mm -hmm. and Gene is, when he's acting, he is, he's a zealot, you know, and something Kenny did, and Gene, and nearly, nearly nailed him. He was all but ready to, wow. that scared the hell out of Kenny, and he did it once with Matt Dillon, not, not violent, mm -hmm. but it was really quite a, uh, I mean, to have a recording of it would have been extraordinary. Matt was this kind of kid and he had a scene and he showed up and said, I just thought, you know, we'd try to do, and Gene said, that's not what you do. And he gave him about five minutes of what it meant to be a serious actor and artist. And it was something. And Matt says to this day, that changed my life. Yeah. That kicked him up a gear. And mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, you know, he was this cute kid, and he was also of that generation of nothing is serious. Well, Gene mm -hmm. said it's serious. Yeah, but we do. Uh, tell me something about Harris Eulen, who I've always liked as an actor, but find him so underused. Well, he's good. He's he's tough. He's a good actor, and and yet there's a kind of um, narcissism that is visible throughout and uh, trying to remember now what what happened with his foot that was not intended I think he's got something I don't think it's in the story I think he, no, he, just, he hurt he, himself he, for real Harris and when Harris did something and so we decided to use it it was mm -hmm. very good so that when he was wrestling with the groceries and Mosby comes up it's all to the good. Yeah. And Mosby's had a football injury yeah. himself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that almost makes his wife a fetishist, you know. Yes. Yes. But, well, these are the things that just work their way into the context they of the work, film. Yeah, because that was not planned. Yeah. Uh, that Harris would have a limp. We never make reference to it, yeah. except when Mosby says, let me help you with those. Yeah. Well, I mean, you'd have to be an idiot because the audience sees there's something wrong, and unless sure. there's a comment on it, yeah. you know, unless it's Lionel Barrymore in a wheelchair, right? Exactly. It's got to be. Tell me, tell me about Melanie Griffith because she's. Uh, you write about her in your book too. I mean, this was she'd never even really considered acting. She was just modeling at the time. She was modeling. She was 14. She was her mother's daughter. She was going with Don Johnson. How they met up, I don't know. Uh, and she went down on a casting call that Gene Lasko, who was Arthur's. Uh, really long-time assistant and, and good friend, uh, set up a, a go-see. And I guess it was her freshness, plus I'm sure her sensuality that probably sealed the deal. She was very raw, and Arthur had to pretty much direct her scene by scene. And I must tell you something very interesting about Melanie as a person. She was the first quote-unquote famous person who agreed to be interviewed for the book. She had me over to the house. Couldn't have been nicer. And the thing we wound up talking about and laughing about is not about the film so much, she said, but she's now getting old enough that people are starting to ask her about the early films that she was in, the same way she grew up watching her mother, Tippi Hedren, be asked about the early films that she was in. And so okay. when everybody would ask Tippi Hedren about Hitchcock, now they're coming to Melanie to ask about Mike Nichols and Arthur Penn and all the people that she's worked with. And it was kind of a strange experience <laughs> for her because, you know, she was down in, in Florida and she was seeing Don Johnson. She wasn't really thinking about what it was like to be in a movie. And she she uh, really had to grasp, and I think did a good job, of remembering what it was like to be uh, to be shooting the movie. Now, Melanie was talking about how you had to direct her at, at one point by, like, like holding, her, holding her legs down or by... She had no technique. She had missed it. She didn't know no. what the hell she was doing. That's true. I wouldn't be surprised, because she was really raw, raw. Yeah. I never... And she had scenes with Jane Hackman, you know. Had some pretty heavy scenes with Gene Hackman. Exactly. So uh, we had to nurse her through. Gene Lasko worked mm -hmm. with her, and then I'd get her on the set with Gene Hackman. And how did you get this naive girl to the point of hysteria for her nightmare scene? It wasn't hard. Her emotions were that accessible to her? No, but we started out uh, sort of artificially, you know, outside. And then it began to come in. And then when Gene comes in, you know, when you get a, somebody else like that, uh -huh. who's apparently believing you, then it, it all follows. That's, that's what good actors do for each other. Well, she's become that. She was really quintessentially 14 when I... Yeah, which is exactly what you needed. Somebody yeah. cultish and naive. Yeah you drop Kelly back into, do you? Somebody says go find my daughter, you go find her. Somebody says go spy on somebody else, you go do that. Now this was Jimmy Wood's first role in a film, wasn't no. it? Very close to it? I think he was in that film with Barbara Streisand about uh, left students. Oh, you're right. He played the intellectual in The Way We Were. The Way We Were. He, he tends to get cast in rather abrasive parts, certainly playing Quentin here, who I... I think he's a good guy in the context oh, of the story. Oh, he's a good guy and he's very but smart. Very smart. 
a little wacko. Mm. Uh, Rather argumentative. Yeah. I remember saying to him once, Jimmy, I wouldn't want to be in your head for 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Another standout performance in the film is provided by actress Jennifer Warren. If Night Moves has a femme fatale, she's it. She's totally electric. I mean, one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. And she plays against that. When, when she talks about what she's done over the years, you know, a little a little uh, uh, dancing, you know, stripping, a little cooking. At first I thought she said hooking, a little everything. You know, this is someone who could walk into any agency and be a top model, and she doesn't do it. She has no respect for herself. Of course, she gets involved in, in this crime. But she was a discovery that Arthur found a kind of a soulmate in the character of Paula, uh, in someone who's seen it all and sort of bats it around and is very defensive. You know, she just will not give anybody the time of day. She asks all these questions to the point where even Gene Hackman at one point says, I'm tired of your ping-pong dialogue. Tell me what's going on. Oh. And then we get away from the noir. So she was putting on. She doesn't want to be hurt. But then we find out that she's lying. So, as I think somebody said, it isn't that she's lying, really. She just doesn't tell the whole truth. And Paula was really a soulmate. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I was sorry to see her die in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she was working him. Yeah. She had no loyalties to anybody. Yeah. Well, that was her character. Yeah. You know, she, she treats everybody like she's a bartender, really. Right. Yeah. The most wonderful line, something Delhi ever gets used to be fighting in the streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where were you when Kennedy was shot? Why do you ask me that? It's one question everybody has an answer to. And a chess match is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Show me that again. Well, Night Moves. Night Moves. Night moves. That's where I got the title. Of course. So in the end, what are we to take from Night Moves, 40 years after its release? Night Moves is very much a mood piece, and you have to sit with it and watch it very, very carefully. You can't just have it on while you're doing something else. It really requires concentration, and if you pay attention to it, I think it's a very rewarding film. But the plot is a little hard to follow. The guy who seems to trigger the plot is blown off in one and a half scenes early on in the film, and you really have to go back and figure out who he was. That's the Marv Elman character, the, uh, the laughing pilot. Uh, and in the end, you, you kind of realize the crime was not really big enough to warrant a full-scale detective film. But then you take a step back and you realize what the crime was, was trashing a culture, taking icons and items from another culture and selling them on the commercial market. And boy, if that isn't a metaphor for what was going on in America, the trashing American culture and making money with it disrespecting it, uh, then I don't know what was. So at mm. first look, Night Moves seems is like a detective film. But you look back and you realize that everything has a touchstone of what was happening in America at the time. And we were very much adrift going in circles at the end. So I'll, whether it's your idea of what happens to Gene Hackman's character or my idea of what happens <laughs> to Gene Hackman's character, uh, 40 years later, you know, something's happened.